Okay, so having covered two methods of horizontal gene transfer, which was a transformation where we took naked DNA up from the environment and conjugation where bacteria are actively swapping DNA between themselves, the next um, horizontal gene transfer method is transduction. This is where viruses are uh, transferring DNA between cells. Okay. So viruses are basically at their most um, simple. They are a protein shell called a capsid that is filled with some nucleic acids, some DNA or RNA. So that's our viral genome, which is encased in the capsid proteins. That's kind of the most simple virus is a naked virus where you have your nucleic acid and your proteins. Uh, you can get a little more complicated where you have your what's called an enveloped virus where you have a nucleic acid in the protein shell again, but it's wrapped in a membrane. Now the virus doesn't build this membrane, a cell will build it and the virus will bud off into these little um, either glycoprotein coats and phospholipid coats and things, having your little envelope there. Or in another, you can have different structures coming out of the protein capsid there to help it attach to the surface of whatever cell it's infecting. Uh, this is the classic sort of bacteriophage. Um, so a phage is short term for bacteriophage, and those are viruses that um, specifically uh, prey on bacteria. Okay. I'm not even going to get into the question of why viruses are alive. But that'll be a topic for an assignment down the road. Okay. So there's our uh, the envelope with the lipid bilayer coming from the cell membrane. Oh, yes, and you have additional. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of this PowerPoint. Awesome. Okay, I did that out of order. Let's keep going. All right, so uh, we've got two main types of phages. We have uh, lytic phages and lysogenic phages. And so the lytic phage is kind of the simplest, most classic um, type of viral uh, infection here. The lytic comes from lysis here, loosening, unbinding, breaking. Um, and so the phage attaches to the surface of the bacteria. It injects some viral DNA into the cell. The host cell basically grabs that DNA and doesn't realize it's viral, starts making new viral DNA. And also this DNA has the um, recipe for making the capsid proteins as well. Okay. The host cell's own DNA is degraded. The virus takes over and basically assembles a whole bunch of phage particles between the um, nucleic acid, the protein cap, and whatever other structures it has. And then at a certain point, the host cell just disintegrates and hundreds and millions of these little viruses are uh, released to go and each one can infect a whole new cell. Okay. So there's this, uh, the lytic phage are the ones that can take over the cell, use it and abuse it and explode it. What just happened? So different types of viruses are using different types of nucleic acids in order to basically trick the cell into making more nucleic acid and proteins for the virus to replicate. Okay. So um, we get these different pathways here in table 11.1. Uh, first off, the double-stranded DNA, okay, where it's just um, it inserts the double-stranded DNA, and then you have transcription of the cells, just sort of like cellular genes, but out in the cytoplasm. Okay. We have single-stranded DNA, where then there's usually genes for replication to make a second strand of the double-stranded DNA, and then it acts sort of like a, a double-stranded virus. So those are a lot of bacteriophages uh, in those two cases. We've got single-stranded RNA, where it's the plus strand, it's the sense strand. It's basically just like a messenger RNA getting inserted into the cell. So that's actually the uh, hep C and tobacco mosaic Zika, SARS, and the coronaviruses are in this category where they're basically inserting a messenger, a bunch of messenger RNA into the cell, and the cell starts transcribing it. Okay. We have um, single-stranded RNA, but it's the anti-sense strand. Okay, the template strand, and then RNA polymerase gets hijacked to make the messenger RNA. And that would be rabies and influenza are in that group. And then we have uh, the single strand where it is the coding strand, but it's not directly transcribed because it's going to get reverse transcribed to single strand RNA by the reverse transcriptase uh, that the, the virus is, is adding in there too. And then that single stranded DNA gets um, made into double stranded DNA and then that gets transcribed. And so that's where the virus is attempting to insert itself into the genome. So that's our retroviruses, including um, HIV. Uh, and then finally, there's this other group that it's double stranded RNA, actually, when that we have the template stranded new transcripts and that's specifically the rotaviruses group. The, um, uh, a lot of childhood uh, diarrhea and 
stuff like that. Yeah. So there's this up and coming technology called phage therapy uh, or viral phage therapy or phagotherapy and using that's using bacteriophages. So these viruses that only attack bacteria to treat a pathogenic bacteria infection. So instead of an antibiotic, a chemical that is um, basically messing with bacterial cell division and um, uh, metabolism. Uh, phage therapy says, well, if you're sick with streptococcus, let's find a bacteriophage that targets streptococcus and release that in order to um, reduce your infection here. Okay. So um, lysin therapy is a, another idea where basically it, it triggers the cells to explode, whereas phage therapy here, the phage infects the cell that is attacking uh, a person and then takes out the um, bacteria in your system, but the phage uh, would have no effect otherwise. It's literally a, a package of cellular material that is designed to attack and infect that one species or even strain of bacteria. Ideally, you would do this uh, targeted to each individual. So the first step would actually be to get a sample of the actual bacteria causing the infection and test it for sensitivity to whether or not you can use some sort of um, antibiotic or you can use a phage cocktail. <laughs> I'm so leaving this in. And then after sort of debating uh, or checking and seeing which of these would work best, you pick the best treatment and actually for that strain that is infecting that one person and put it back into that, that particular person. So really um, specialized and personalized medicine is really where we should be going in terms of having the best outcomes for the maximum number of people. This is not cheap and this is not fast, so we will see. Fortunately, I think only rich people are going to get these for a while, but we can hope. Okay. So a lot of times people are talking about uh, plaques, like uh, phage plaques. And what a, so first you start with the lawn of bacteria, this plate here that creamy film is actually a film of bacteria growing on the surface of an agar medium. And then uh, when you treat those bacteria with phages, the phage, uh, just one, starts a chain reaction of infections. And so after a while, you actually see these holes where the bacteria are being killed and the phages are spreading outwards and killing the next round of bacteria and so forth. And so these little holes are called plaques. Okay. So when we hear the um, uh, phage plaques, uh, that's what this is referring to. It's actually, these are areas of dead bacteria, but filled with viral particles that are spreading throughout that bacterial population. So our viruses here are giving us transduction, this sort of movement of DNA between host cell and recipient cell. And in this case, it comes from the virus actually kind of screwing up. Okay. So generally the phage genome, when it's the, the phage is building new copies of itself within that infected cell, uh, it packs the viral DNA back up into the new capsid, but occasionally it messes that up and instead some of the host DNA from that cell is packed up into the viral coat instead of the um, viral DNA. Okay? It could just be a chunk, it could be a gene or a segment here or there, or just a massive amount. Okay? And then when that capsid, you know, if it still has all the, this particular one has all the functional proteins for attaching and inserting the new DNA in, but lo and behold, the DNA is not actually viral DNA, there's a chunk of host DNA. So the virus is the um, unit of transfer and transduction that's actually moving the DNA from the host cell to the recipient cell accidentally. So we talked a little bit about lytic phages, ones where they just explode basically and release the, the, the bacteria into the environment. So, and lysogenic viruses have a lytic phase as well. So on the outside ring here, we see the virus attaching, it's entering, there's the DNA. We're starting to build and assemble more of the viral DNA in the capsid. Uh, it's assembled and packaged, and then the cell splits and all of those uh, viruses go on to infect new cells. Now, a lysogenic virus has this uh, extra cycle here. So the, when the DNA is inserted and then it's repressed, it sits, it doesn't immediately go into the lytic cycle. And, but that DNA eventually becomes integrated into the host cell's genome. Okay, so now we have the host cell, we have this little strip of this retroviral DNA that's just gonna sit there. And the cell can replicate and replicate and replicate and no further infection until at some point it just keeps going through the cycle and then it starts to build um, 
viral, new viral particles assemble and pack in lice. But these retroviruses are nasty because they can just sit in this lysogenic cycle, this uh, lysogenic, so to split genes, okay? This viral DNA is popping in and splitting the genes that were already in the, in the genome there and incorporating itself in. So they're um, uh, harder to track and see and they can lay dormant for quite a while. So this uh, inserted DNA here is sometimes called the prophage when it's inserted and has not yet become part of the genome. And then there's this, uh, so the prophage gets entered in, it sits there, and then eventually it gets integrated into the gene with uh, integrase is the enzyme that performs that. And then we're having sp site-specific recombination where there's actually kind of matching areas to the genome that help this prophage insert itself into the genome by looking similar to, to various spots in the bacterial chromosome. And now our cellular replication continues, and now we've got a viral genome embedded in our in our bacterial chromosome here. And this can happen in eukaryotes as well. So we're not going to get too specific here, but needless to say, the phage uh, helps itself integrate by matching to certain sites. So here's the phage genome here, has this particular site that matches up to uh, a specific site in the bacteria that it's targeting. So that helps the uh, integration step into the genome by having the site specific recognition. You don't need to know the genes or the names of the sites, but we need to know that there's site specific integration that's helping match up the phage genome to the bacterial genome so that integrase can pop it in. And then in here, um, we're going to just say that I don't, you don't need to worry too much about this, except that this uh, excision here, because that prophage can actually like pop out okay, of the genome. It can excise itself very precisely and take the whole piece with it. Okay? Although sometimes we have imprecise excision, so that um, retroviral genome only a little bit leaves and a little bit stays but it also has taken a chunk of the new uh, host genome there with it, and it's going to move along. So just in this, with the prophage popping in and out of the genome over time, uh, you can get movement of different DNA between species. Viruses can leave some of their DNA behind, or they can pick up some of the host DNA and accidentally move it along with them. Okay. There's another type of phage referred to sometimes. It's called a temperate phage. And this is one where it doesn't explode the cell. It doesn't kill the cell at the end, okay? So M13 is sort of the, the flag mark here, the flagship phage here. Uh, it goes in, it does its DNA replication, it makes phages, but and the phages are extruded from the cell. The cell doesn't explode and die. And the cell is infected with this M13 phage and it continues to grow and divide. So you have a population of cells that have an active virus kind of living within them and they're producing the virus, but they're also um, undergoing their regular cell growth cycle and DNA replication and mitosis as well. But in the meantime, they're also producing shedding viruses. Phage conversion is another phenomenon that we can see where a bacteria that wasn't previously nasty, okay, didn't tend to kill people right off the bat, once it's infected with a particular phage, a virus that comes along and infects it, it suddenly starts producing a virulence factor, something super nasty. So in uh, Shirashia coli, we have the um, plenty of strains of E. coli that don't really do a whole lot or make you minorly sick, but if this lambda phage infects it, it has a codes a gene for the Shiga-like toxin, and suddenly you get hemorrhagic, like you are shitting blood out of your ass type diarrhea that will kill you very, very fast, okay? So E. coli is not horrifically terrible to you until it's been activated. It's been phage converted by this lambda phage that now produces a new phenotype, a new enzyme that has a terrible phenotype. Okay, so this has a selective advantage in terms of the uh, phage, not particularly the uh, bacteria, but it's going to increase dissemination of viral particles. It's going to kill the host ultimately. Somebody who's got uh, Shiga-like Shiga um, E. coli is not going to live very long, but they are certainly going to make a whole bunch of viral particles spread in this hemorrhagic diarrhea, which could infect more and more hosts and as a benefit for the phage but not for the bacteria, okay? 
So that's a phage conversion there. So we had our lytic viruses, pretty simple cycle. We had our lysogenic viruses, also pretty simple, uh, but ended in a uh, cell explosion. And now we're going to talk a little bit about retroviruses, which is um, a different, this is an RNA virus. It's using RNA as its nucleic acid. And it's kind of three main genes here is we have a reverse transcriptase because it's going to turn that RNA into DNA. We have a ribonuclease where it's going to um, clip up um, uh, RNA, other RNA, and then the integrase that's going to help the R, the DNA that it's produced uh, get into the host genome. Okay, so it's going to convert itself from RNA to DNA as it moves in. So here we go. Uh, we'll caps it here. It's got a it's got an enveloped in a membrane here, a phospholipid membrane. It's got attachment proteins that are searching for recognition sites on the cells. In this case, the white blood cells. So it attaches. It inserts. It's um, uh, nucleic acids there, converts itself into DNA, integrates into the genome of the nucleus, which is then going to um, basically is called a provirus. The whole virus itself gets uh, into the nucleus of the cell and starts replicating. And then it will start to produce new and enveloped. It's actually going to bud off. Um, so you're going to have your nucleic acid in the middle, your proteins wrapping around it, and then it's going to have a phospholipid membrane, which now that it's in white blood cells, it's going to have white blood cell um, signal markers, which make it very, very hard for the body to find and fight it off because it's masquerading as a white blood cell, thanks to these glycoproteins. Okay. So when we look at the human genome, we actually see that a big chunk of the human genome is kind of leftover retroviruses. People who didn't die, this, where the DNA became dysfunctional, it's no longer serving a purpose, but it's just hanging around in there. There's an awful lot of our DNA that is just leftover viral infections from millions and millions of years of um, genetic just copying and replication. Our next section here is we're going to talk a little bit about transposable elements. So we have the whole, our virus is really alive. Well, they're not carrying out cellular mechanisms and our cell is our um, sort of minimum definition of life, that it's got metabolism, whereas viruses are kind of hijacking that system. Well, transposable elements are like even simpler than viruses. They don't even have a protein code or anything. They're just genes that are moving themselves. You know, call them, they were term jumping genes. They'll move around within the genome here. Okay, so instead of moving DNA between genomes, thank you, helper cats. Why'd you be nice? Uh, transposable elements are actually moving DNA within genomes. Okay, so this is really, these guys are less about horizontal gene transfer and more about um, mutation and novel genome uh, rearrangements, but we're going to cover them a little here because they bear a lot of similarity to viruses. So these transposable elements, so to transpose is to move around, right? Um, is a discrete segment of DNA that catalyzes its own movement to another location on the gene. Okay, and this is they look really similar to RNA viruses. Okay, and but then like lysogenic viruses where it clips itself out and can kind of move around, these transposable elements use the same idea of site-specific recognition where they're kind of finding a spot and popping themselves in between certain sites. Okay. So the structures are all very similar. Again, I don't want you to go too in depth on all these gag pole orphs and such, but we want to know what we want to know about transposable elements is they have these really defined ends. These little end pieces are really clutch. They make it work. They encode the functions that are responsible for the transposable element being able to move itself. Okay. And we have two main types. Okay. We have a retrotransponsin, the class one that we find in eukaryotes and has that RNA intermediate. It's very similar to like a retrovirus and it has the reverse transcriptase in order to write itself, uh, takes the RNA copy of itself and copies it into DNA. Okay. So this is a copy and paste. The, um, the original stays in one place, but can make a copy of itself that moves somewhere else in the genome. Okay, so where's this one? This is the type one here. Not that it matters. They're all sort of the same uh, with the, what we really care about, these long terminal repeats on the ends that help that uh, transposable element jump around. Now, the other type is the DNA transposable elements called class two, and these are more of a cut and paste. They actually remove themselves out of wherever they are in the genome and move themselves to a new place entirely. And they don't leave um, the original behind. And this has a DNA intermediate. It encodes as, instead of um, 
the, the reverse transcriptase up here, this actually codes an enzyme called transposase that helps it move. And it has these matching inverted repeats on the ends, which are called insertion sequences. So we'll see the IS element here. That's the insertion sequence that helps the transposable, move, uh, transposable element move around. So those insertion sequence elements at the end are often inverted repeats. Usually this isn't something you want in molecular biology. You don't want your stuff to match up um, outside of your specific sequence you're looking for. But what this actually allows the element to do is form a hairpin structure. The bane of molecular biologists is actually this um, idea of, of forming this little pin or loop is what helps the tra uh, transposable element move around. So this intrastrand within the strand base pairing, this end, these two ends are going to pair up together. So the key is that these terminal inverted repeats are lining up, all four of them, and then you get this loop of DNA, okay? which is this is pretty stable and can last in the cell. It's hard for um, the DNA cyst to target this folded structure. Meanwhile, the transposase is making an asymmetric cut in the DNA that allows the um, transposable element to insert itself. Okay. So it's making its own, um, it's got a gene here that codes for the transposase, and then that will make the cuts that will allow it to encode, uh, insert itself, and now transposase can be made off of this uh, DNA strand here. And so they can sort of self-propagate. They're nothing more than just a strand of DNA or a strand of RNA, but they are literally moving themselves around in genomes all the time. So here's another uh, example of one. This is a, a TN5 transposon which is kind of a separate thing. So we have transposable elements and then we, uh, which are commonly called transposons, but more specifically, uh, transposons are a DNA transposable element that's found in bacteria that can't move on its own. It has to get moved by, there's a whole separate system for moving around transposons. Um, I won't get too worried if you switch that around because in, in like uh, gen biology terminology, transposon and transposable element are synonymous. Um, but just to, I just wanted to clarify that. And so um, transposable elements that cannot move on their own are termed non-autonomous, whereas elements that can move on their own, like the one we saw previously, that's called autonomous. Okay. So these things, these transposable elements, are one of the principal sources for mutations and for genetic variation because they're just jumping and swapping and maybe they cut out a little bit extra or they disrupt a gene. And so lots of uh, genetic variation occurring within our genomes thanks to these transposable elements. They make up a lot of our genome. Retrotransposins here, the class one transposable elements, the RNA ones, make up almost 50% of our genome. And then we've got about another 10% that are DNA transposins. Okay, so they are extremely frequent in our DNA. Okay, and there's a bunch of different different kinds. Don't worry too much about the uh, different kinds, but just know that we have retrotransposins and the DNA transposins in our genome. Now, a couple of good things happened from these uh, transposable elements uh, being inserted into our genome. Uh, telomerase, the gene that allows us to, the enzyme uh, that allows us to extend the ends of our linear chromosomes, which is a reverse transcriptase, is very related and likely derived from a retrotransposome. So, yay, um, protecting our uh, chromosomal material, very nice. The vertebrate immune system, uh, has this enzymes RAG1, RAG2 that rearrange immunoglobin genes in order to keep our um, sort of response to foreign DNA sharp and crisp. And these were, again, likely derived from a DNA element that was inserted back in the um, evolution of the uh, that immune system. Now, more often than not, transposable elements cause problems, massive problems. Hemophilia A, the allele for that, that causes you to not be able to have clotting blood, is from a transposable and element insertion. Uh, coleorectal tumors, lots of them are human-specific retrotransponsin insertions, and therefore they can be genetically passed down, the propensity can be genetically passed down. Um, severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, you know, bubble boys and the kids that like can never see or touch anything because their immune system is bonk. Yeah, that's caused by uh, transposable elements. Um, stress enhanced fear learning uh, in mice, and which can lead to PTSD. Also, uh, transposable elements play a part in whether or not you're more or less susceptible to that. 
And then these mobile elements, they, we don't have solid data, but they have been implicated. And there's research ongoing into uh, autism spectrum disorder, neurodegenerative diseases, aging, and a bunch of other things where this is a, a hot topic right now, has been for a while. They are hard to track and find and match to phenotypes, but that's a lot of um, current human disease researches on these transposable elements.